just a big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. I dear Miss Muffet. What a fearful looking beast. I come to frighten you away. Sorry, Charlie. Us little girls aren't frightened by spiders anymore. Rats. Domo arrogato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn Stag Talks About Everything podcast. Today in the podcast, we pause to look at the Grammys very briefly because they think they're offending us. They think that we're just going to freak out because they want to do some sort of weirdo satanic thingy. So we're going to move on from there and continue in the book of Genesis. We're going to talk a little bit about Adam, a little bit about Noah, a little bit about Abraham, a little bit about Israel, a little bit about stuff, a little bit about Isaac, a little bit about Jacob, a little bit about this, a little bit about that, a little bit about covenants. Oh dear, the Grammys have gone all satanic. I can't watch it. Oh no, they're really sticking it to me. I am a Christian, and oh, they are really getting at me, aren't they? Oh, they're so clever at the way they really deny my faith in all that. You know, I never recover from this here thing at the Grammys. Oh, they're so, they're so clever. What do these people think? These people at the Grammys, they do this whole salute to Satan, which is about the 47th salute to Satan <laughs> that they've done at these big shows in the last number of years. It's comical in one way. It's sad in another. I mean, they might be leading a generation astray, even though nobody's watching the Grammys. They're trying to tell you how many people are... <clears throat> the Grammys are coming back. Yeah, from the absolute worst numbers in the universe, there's slightly more people watching. It's still the third worst numbers of all time, and they're all been post-2017 worst numbers of all time. But regardless, they are influencing somebody, so I'm not happy about it, but if they think they're sticking it to me, and I'm going shaking my fists at the TV going... Oh, please stop. You're really denying my faith. How can I believe the Bible now? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, they're delusional again. And it's really an attitude a lot of us should have about a lot of things. Uh, again, I, I deal with all kinds of people across the religious spectrum uh, online. And I really don't care. I mean, I, I mean, I say this, you know what I mean when I say this, if you listen to this podcast, I don't care what they believe, meaning they're free to believe whatever they want to believe. But, you know, don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. That's the thing. You know, we talked about that. We talked about uh, Catholics. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But if you say you're Catholic and you believe the Catholic Church, well, then when I quote the Catholic Church, don't get upset with me. I'm just quoting what you say you believe. Right. And then when I quote the contradictions in their decrees, feel free. Feel free to believe the contradictions if you want. I, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I say I don't, really don't care. I do care. I mean, I don't want people to believe incorrectly. That's why I do the podcast. Uh, to at least let you give you things to think about. But at the end of the day, either way, it's up to you. I'm not your guru. I'm not infallible. But uh, that's, this is what's going on in the world. And now this, we're going to back up here. We're talking about Adam. And we talked about the centrality of Christ. You might notice I saw this little nasal thing I had last time too. I don't know. I feel fine. She's in love with me and I feel fine. But I'm, you know, just, I don't know, this little nasal thing. I can breathe fine. I'm just kind of stuck up in there. Anywho, enough of that. We've talked about this, this common theme of Christ all the way through. Now, we touched briefly on Abraham. We're moving forward. We're going to stop at Noah just for a second. I mean, Noah's an absolutely huge topic, but again, we're not stopping to do huge topics here. Well, we're, we're looking at huge topics with a big lens, I should say that. A huge topic like Noah, you could... I could talk about Noah for, for a while, for a number of podcasts, but I'm not going to because again, we're doing big, big picture of big pictures. Now, of course, we have the ark, which is the ark is Christ. It has one door. It is pitched in and out with pitch, which is the word for atonement. We talked about that. But when Noah lands, and again, the, there's a debate as to whether it was a local flood or a, or a worldwide flood. I tend to lean on the side of it as a worldwide flood for a number of reasons, but I won't go into here. But well, the reason God had to do it is not because what you see in the cartoons of a bunch of people laughing at Noah going, ha, 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 we're going to continue being evil. I mean, they were being evil. But what was going on is you had um, from the garden, you can see this in form, that uh, the sons of 
God, which is a reference to angelic beings. Now, you got to get out of your head. Just as we talk about you got to get out of your head, this heaven, hell, save, lost dichotomy. You need to get out of your head this idea of angels and demons that you saw from comic books. Okay, these are spiritual beings who also had free will. And we know that Satan's pride got to him, etc. Lucifer's pride got to him. And he fell from his place. He fell from his place. And again, we have to understand Satan too. Satan's not in the business of what everybody thinks he is. Like this, this thing at the Grammys. This idea of... You know, it's, uh, <laughs> I hate to even talk about it. But it's it's not the the Satan of Scripture. The Satan of Scripture is a very clever being. And he's very deceptive. Right? He's not... You know, what they did at the Grammys is not deceiving me. What is going to deceive believers, particularly, he wants two, two types of deception. One is to deceive people away from the truth of God and the truth of Christ in the final work of the Lord, etc., the deity of Christ. The other thing he wants to do is to deceive believers into getting away from studying scriptures for themselves, into getting them into systems and like catechisms and church fathers and all those things that are not scripture. Remember what Paul tells us about Satan. Satan presents himself as an angel of light and his ministers are the ministers of righteousness. Right? So this is his primary. Now he will use anything if you give it to him. Scripture also says that if a woman withholds herself from her husband, he can use that to get a foothold and destroy that marriage. Now what's going on in the West here is there's a concerted effort to destroy the family. That's what this whole transgender thing is. That's what the whole LGBTQ thing is. It's, it's a demeaning of the nuclear family that God created. So if they can destroy that, and again, they're, not, they're destroying it in, in the name of righteousness. They are the righteous ones. They are the virtuous ones, right? They're, they're the virtuous ones because they hold to these ideals and they take these transgender people and they exalt them as good and righteous and even holy in many cases. And then, of course, you see it within the church. Eh, I shouldn't say that. We see it within Christendom. It also creeps into the true church, and I use that word generically. But with it, with, throughout Christendom, the two point whatever billion people who claim some sort of connection to Christ, there is this huge, huge movement, huge movement uh, within these places to run to virtue signal. We've talked about the church near me that puts up a giant sign in their yard, you know, end racism and hate has no home here and those kinds of things as though, again, they're, they're tilting at windmills. I'm not saying there isn't racism or isn't hate in the world, but they're creating these boogeymen so they can appear to tell the whole world how righteous they are, which again is what they've always said they hated about Christians. They're out there, you know, supposedly pointing our fingers at people and telling them how evil they are. Well, that's what they do all the time. <laughs> Okay, and as you know from this podcast, we hold the Second Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins against them. Now, he's been reconciled to man, and man's job is to be reconciled to God. And that we have the ministry of reconciliation, Paul says then. And that's true in that dispensation and in the current one, is to tell people that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins against them. But if they don't want to be reconciled to God, they can hold on to their sins and the penalty for sin is death, as we learned from Adam. Anyway, back to Noah, you had these fallen angels and they came down and they saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they bred with them and they bred a race of giants. And we said there were giants in the land then and the scripture says, and later on. And of course, we know those of us who know our basic Bible, who read the little Bible stories book in the doctor's office, that David will someday fight. A giant. And we also know that before Israel goes into the land, the spies go in in the book of Joshua and they go in and they see giants in the land. Okay, so there's giants. So there's incursions. Now, this is not hard to understand if you understand the spiritual world and you're not limited to what's in your backyard. If you understand there's a spiritual world, if you understand that we are on this creation and we are not this tiny, minuscule, meaningless, accidental thing in the t in in the middle of an enormously incomprehensible universe, uh, which is what you're being taught, but which for which is not not true. Okay, <laughs> it's plenty of evidence against it. But that this is the center of God's plan, 
Adam was the center of God's plan, the fall happened, etc. God giving people free will, including people free will as well as angelic beings. Anyway, so this race has to be destroyed. So God destroys the world with a flood. And but afterward, sin enters in almost immediately in the eight people. And we have the, the three lines, a line of Japheth, which is basically the European races and other similar races such as this. We have the sons of Shem, which is this, where we get this word Semite from, the Shemites, which would be where Abraham was called from, the nation of Israel and other Semitic people. Jews are not the only Semites. And then um, Ham, the Hamitic people, and the his child Canaan, etc. So again, we're not going to go through the, the nations, the table of nations, but they are there in your Babel, the table of nations. After the settling, after uh, Noah settles, and uh, then you have the nations that rise up, seventy nations. Again, we will see this in picture form when Israel comes out of Egypt. Uh, they are they come unto a land that has twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. This is a picture of the twelve tribes of Israel uh, and God's plan for them to be the sustenance for the nations someday. Again, that is not currently the case. So don't go running wild with that. That's a picture of God's plan for the 12 tribes. Right? And the 12 tribes come from uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham's son Isaac. God asked Abraham, commanded Abraham to take Isaac up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, and God provided a ram, another picture of a substitutionary death. Abraham was being obedient to the Lord. It was counted unto him for righteousness. Very important truth there. But God replaced him, and so... They, they offered the ram up to the Lord in place of Isaac. And then Isaac had twins, but one of whom was Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. And he had 12 sons. There's your 12 tribes. All right, we can get into all of that. Again, there's so many things I'd love to talk about, but I don't want to get bogged down. But that's how we get there. So we go Adam, and then, you know, so many years later, uh, you have Noah. And then so many years later, uh, after, after Noah and the floods and the nation, you get Abraham called out. And then you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob becomes name changed to Israel. He has 12 sons. There's where your 12 nations are. From those, it's the nations of of Benjamin and Judah. Judah, where we get the name Jew from. Uh, And out of the tribe of Benjamin, we're going to get King Saul. But uh, the Lord is from the the tribe of Judah, as David is, the son of David. So we just hope you kept up with all that. So we're backing up now to Abraham. So Abraham is a key figure in Scripture. Abraham is called out of Ur the Chaldees, out of a pagan land, and God promises him uh, his own country. And he is obedient to the Lord. And again, he is obedient when he takes him, takes his son, his only son, the son of his old age, he and his wife, Sarai, Sarah later. Uh, Abram originally, Abraham later changed. Abram, I think, means the son of one or something, and Abraham means the son of many. I mean, the, son of the father of many, father of one, father of many. Which was kind of a joke. He didn't have any children, but he became the father of a nation. So anyway, but what we learn from Abraham, again, this is huge picture stuff, is that Abraham, he is the central figure that Paul uses in the book of Romans and in Galatians when he is speaking of faith. And he says that uh, in Romans, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness, which is a quote from Genesis 15. And he says in Galatians, just as Abraham believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Even James says it too. Abraham believed God, it was counted him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. This is very central to explaining, particularly to Jews who had the law, that their, their righteousness comes from their faith, not from the law. And so, again, and Paul makes this point as well by saying that uh, the law came 430 years later. The law came 430 years later, and it cannot annul. Paul's very clear about this. The law cannot annul, cannot annul, right, what the promises that were made to Abraham. Abraham didn't have the law. Adam didn't have the law. Noah didn't have the law. Now, they weren't lawless, small l. We know, obviously, Adam's sons, Cain and Abel, that Cain murdered Abel, and that was wrong. It was known to be wrong. It was understood to be wrong. Paul lays this out in Romans chapter 1. I know we're jumping around, and if you're not familiar with your Bible, I'm sorry. Uh, But you can write these down and go look at them. 
Chapter 1, Paul talks about sort of the demise of Gentile nations, where they continue to d- decay from their God-given conscience. We are born with a conscience. Now, you got to teach kids. Kids will naturally do what's selfish. Right? They'll, naturally do, they'll naturally do what's selfish. Even times when they do unselfish things, it's because they want praise, right? And we see that too in adults. Sometimes adults do things that are good outwardly. It's because they want praise. This is the whole virtue signaling thing. This church wants to wants people to think, oh, they're so wonderful. You know, they want the praise we're putting up a sign that says end racism, which won't do anything, won't end any racism, won't affect anybody at all ever. But they feel good about it. So that's true all the time as well. But there's also something inherently in a child you can tell that they, they know what's wrong. And particularly when you get older and you come into your age of consciousness and we know murder is wrong. Uh, we are driven naturally uh, towards certain things that we know are right and we know are wrong. We know stealing is wrong. Now, what happens is people sear their conscience. The little conscience that they have there that tells them right from wrong, they eventually don't care anymore. They sear it. it cannot, they cannot hear it anymore. And this is what Paul talks about, the decay of the nations. And then they continually decay. And then, again, men are, in, are incurably religious. Right? That's what we said, that the, uh, you know, well, atheism wasn't going to destroy America. It was false religion, which is doing it false spirituality. Right? But even then, men who do become atheists, they discard God. People who become spiritual uh, and discard the true God, they all decay into the same sorts of things. Some form of self-righteousness combined with some sort of uh, physical uh, wickedness. Now, again, somebody can, can lead an outwardly righteous life, but we don't know what their mind is doing, right? And they could be doing it for the, all the wrong reasons. And then this, this, of course, leads to false worship. Uh, the worshiping of idols, uh, people who desperately want religion. Paul says when he comes to Athens, now that's an interesting thing in the book of Acts, we've jumped in way into the book of Acts, uh, after the Gospels, after Pentecost, Paul goes, and now when Paul talks to Jews, he's always talking about Moses and the law. When he talks to Gentiles, he does not. And we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about the law. But Paul, when he talks to uh, at Athens, these pagans, he goes up there and he says to them, I perceive you are a superstitious people. And this word could be translated religious. Right? Now, these, are, these are, they're pagans. They're worshiping false gods. They have a whole bunch of statues there to gods. And one of them says to the unknown God, just in case they're not worshiping all the gods. And here's one to the unknown God. And Paul says, well, let me declare to you who this God is. Now, let me pause here and talk about words for a minute. To the unknown God is Theos. And Paul refers to the true God as Theos. So, Truth is not found simply in words. We talked about this when we talked about Yeshua. You can go back to that. Uh, there's several people named Yeshua in Scripture, and Yeshua in the Hebrew form is never used by the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus, even though that would be his name in Hebrew. Uh, we are given the name uh, Iesus, which is the Greek. right? But Jesus is fine. Uh, Yeshua is fine, just it's not holier than anything else. And again, other people are called Yeshua in Scripture. Particularly in the Old Testament, Joshua is Yeshua, and then there's Yeshua, the, the high priest, and then there is the son of Yeshua, son of Jesus in the New Testament, somebody who's called that, and a friend of Paul's name is Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus. So again, we often, and of course, Scripture uses pronouns. He, him, is used of a lot of people, including the Lord. So again, the Lord expects us to understand context, and he knows when, when we talk about the Lord Jesus, who we're talking about. Because a lot of people in Christendom use the name of the Lord Jesus, but uh, they have the wrong Jesus. Paul says there's another Jesus. There's another Jesus who doesn't save. There's another Jesus who can't get your mother out of purgatory. You can. You can. <laughs> you can have masses said where Mary can get her out of purgatory, but the Lord on his own cannot do that. That is not the Lord of Scripture. right? Well, purgatory is not in Scripture anyway, but that is not the Lord of Scripture. So even if you have the right name, even if you have the name Yeshua, and a lot of Yeshua people are law keepers. They think they're keeping the law. They're delusional, but they think they're keeping the law. So now we're getting way ahead of ourselves. So uh, we're going to close here in just the next couple of minutes, I think, I hope. That's the plan. So we've gone from from Adam, and then we come to Noah, and then we come to Abraham. Now we're about uh, 2,000 years into the history of man, because people lived much longer before the flood. Now, uh, after the flood, and then we now have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is called out. One of his sons, Joseph, is another picture of the Lord Jesus. 
Uh, we have no sin recorded against Joseph, even though we obviously know he's a sinner. And then he was sold by his brethren into slavery. And they, this is how the Jews end up in Egypt, which we're going to get to uh, next time on Exodus. We touched on Exodus here with the uh, the 12 wells of water and the palm, 70 palm trees. But we're going to talk about the law. We're going to talk about the old covenant. Now, here, I'm just going to kind of tease you a little bit here and just tease them a little. The Bible is not split into old covenant, new covenant. You're, I know it says Old Testament, New Testament. And that's just a convenient way to refer to it. But Adam didn't have no old covenant. Noah didn't have an old covenant. Abraham didn't have an old covenant. The covenant was given way in, well, way later, <laughs> after the slavery of 400 years of captivity. Uh, and it comes, again, Paul says 430 years the law was given covenant after Abraham. So it's many years later that Abraham was already called declared righteous by faith alone without the law. And the law cannot annul the promises, right? So we're going to actually read the Old Covenant, which comes along uh, round about the early part of the book of Exodus 19. So we're going to read that right before God gives the Ten Commandments, etc., and talk about the purpose of all that. And then the New Covenant. It's not like, okay, Jesus died on the cross. Now New Covenant. No, no, read the New Covenant. The New Covenant is actually found in the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Jeremiah. You can go read it for yourself. Uh, round about chapter 31 to 33 is in there, but you'll see it specifically where it says New Covenant. And it's referenced in the book of Hebrews where it quotes from Jeremiah. And in there, it has not yet come in. Yeah, there's some people who say that it came in in the book of Acts in some form. Okay, I can live with that. But we're going to talk about the Old Covenant, New Covenant. And it's not, everybody's on the Old Covenant. You had to obey the law. And then Jesus came, don't have to obey the law. That, and they say by grace. No, that's not Old Covenant, New Covenant. That, that is uh, heaven, hell, saved, lost thinking, right? From Adam to today, to tomorrow, to whenever you hear this podcast, men are saved by grace, through faith, in God, as understood, in God's provision. Now, we understand that to be Christ, because that's the revelation we have. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, went to the cross, died for our sins. He went to the grave three days and three nights. He rose again defeating, he did not corrupt, he did not decay, defeating the curse of corruption on Adam, defeating the curse of death on Adam, and then from Adam upon all of us, he defeated those. So our hope is resurrection because of the Lord. Adam's hope was resurrection. Abraham's hope is resurrection. Moses' hope is resurrection. This is the hope of scripture, that the curse of death will be undone someday, and it is undone in Christ alone. You understand? So, the Bible's not about heaven, hell, saved, lost. Uh, it's, it is about faith. And when we talk about the Old Covenant and New Covenant, we're going to see their purposes. And the purposes of both, here's a spoiler alert, is they're for Israel. And they involve the earth. They involve God's plan for the earth. God has a plan for the earth. He has a plan for the heavens and what comes down from the heavens. He has a plan for kingdom. And he has a plan for the far above heavens where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the Father. So that's, not everybody has the same hope, right? Scripture talks about the families of God. We're all saved by grace through faith. Any dispensation, any age, any hope. If your hope is, is bound to the earth, then you need to consider the things of the earth. If your hope is not bound to the earth, then you don't need to worry about the things of the earth. Anyway, um, there's spoiler alerts. But we're going to stop. We're getting a little longer now, but we've been shorter lately, so that's okay. So I hope you have a great day. I hope I haven't confused you too much. If you want more detail on this, I have a seven-part, I think, video series at my YouTube page, which has uh, slides on it. So it explains it a little bit more. Again, it's still big picture. It's called um, the Bible from 30,000 feet, and it goes from Genesis through Exodus, a little more organized than I am here. And it has slides, and it lays out these things and how to interpret your scripture. But it's, again, it's up to you at the end of the day. I have a four-part, even much shorter, video series that you can get from my blog. If you go to my blog, which is uh, www, you got to put that in there, www.contextorconfusion, one word, dot com, www.contextorconfusion.com. At the very top, there's that four-part. It's They're very short, very short, interpret, how to interpret your Bible. If you go to my YouTube page, which is uh, a boy from Plymouth, slash a boy from Plymouth, or at Michael Scotto, there at YouTube, you will see a playlist for 30,000, uh, the Bible from 30,000 feet. 
And so that's again, that has slides in it, PowerPoint presentations, walks you through everything. You get a lot more organized than we are here. So have a great day and we'll talk to you on the flip side. And remember, don't worry about these stupid Grammy people. I mean, you know, this is it's nonsense. I mean, I laugh at them. It's stupid. I mean, stupid. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, you know, it's all based on Greek mythology, basically. But oh, they're sticking it to me. Oh, no, how will I ever recover? Okay, we'll see you on the flip side. Hey, try the frog. Yeah, oh, don't, don't try the frog. Oh, hey, frog. Yeah, hi there, Mr. Spider. I come to fight you away.